Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope everyone is doing really well. I'm uh, recording on uh, Sunday, the 10th of January today, 2021. And today I'd like to talk about uh, uh, Canto 10, 10th Canto of Inferno by Dante Alighieri. Canto 10 is uh, an outstanding canto, one of the most memorable ones. And uh, today I'm going to follow uh, Pinsky, as I usually tend to do. The Pinsky translation together with uh, Mark Musa's translation and uh, also I'm going to um, quote some comments from this book called Mimesis by Eric Auerbach the representation of reality in Western literature I have to give huge thanks to John David um, who gave me this uh, great recommendation to uh, grab a copy of this mimesis because not only it's a great um, literary criticism uh, type of book and one I understand one of the most important ones but it also has a full chapter uh, dedicated solely to Canto 10 of uh, Inferno and so I'm going to quote a couple of comments from this as well. The tenth canto of uh, the Inferno is a uh, an extremely strong canto, strong from a theatrical standpoint, meaning that uh, it contains images and scenes that can very hardly be forgotten, and also is very strong uh, for its author, for Dante. It was a very, very personal and uh, emotional canto for Dante himself, because it touches on uh, uh, topics, not only topics, but also people and, and real characters of his life that uh, who had a uh, great importance for him. At the very beginning of the canto, I noticed that uh, there is a perfect example of uh, how the English translation from um, uh, the original Italian uh, can sometimes make the Divine Comedy a little bit easier to understand in uh, removing some small obstacles, linguistic obstacles, uh, that modern Italians have when reading the comedy. This perfect example is here. Uh, the first line in Pinsky says, and now along the narrow pathway that ran. And the Musa says something very similar. Now we go on along the narrow pathway. The Italian version is, ora sen va per un secreto calle. And the immediate um, meaning or what uh, a modern Italian immediately understands from this adjective secreto is secret as if this uh, path that Dante and Virgil are walking on was a secret path. But that's really not the meaning that Dante intended. Narrow is the meaning. He's uh, um, referring to a physical characteristic of the path rather than... A, it's a small detail, but um, it, I hope it helps explaining how uh, sometimes reading the English version is a little bit more fluid, a little bit more free-flowing in a sense. O matchless power, I began, who lead me through evil circles at your will, speak to me with the answers that I crave about these souls and the sepulchres they fill. Might they be seen? The cover of each grave is lifted open, and no one is on guard. I always smiled at this comment, no one is on guard, um, almost uh, childlike from Dante's side. Can we take a look? Look, there's no guardian, so can I, can I go and take a look? Virgil says, uh, when they return from their after judgment day, these souls will be closed. They will have their uh, physical bodies and they will, they will be finally closed inside their tombs. Um, I can explain to you uh, that, uh, this is what Virgil says to Dante, that um, Epicurus, Epicurus is lying here with all of his followers who call uh, the soul dead when the flesh dies. One of the main points of contention, one of the main reasons why Epicureanism was a heresy in Dante's times was that uh, it didn't believe in the life of a soul after death. Hence, uh, let's enjoy life as long as it lasts. Um, call the question that you raise will soon be answered now that we are inside. So the answer is positive from Virgil. And so will the secret wish you don't express. Secret a question that actually Dante has already, in a certain sense, expressed 
uh, earlier in Canto VI uh, with Chaco, if we remember when uh, he said that not only he was interested in knowing the fate of uh, some notable Florentines like uh, Farinata, but also he wanted to potentially meet Farinata as well. So Virgil knows where Dante is going, as usual. I say, dear guide, believe me, I do not hide my heart from you, except through my intention to speak but little, the way that you have said earlier I ought to be disposed. As usual, this uh, scholar and master relationship that keeps developing. Beautifully, beautifully. Um, and that's where all of a sudden this uh, almost baritonal voice, this is at least how I imagine it, and also is helped by this O tosco, uh, all these O sounds, uh, comes out from the tomb. This is, uh, of course, Farinata. Farinata was Manente degli Uberti, a very famous, uh, even before Dante's times, Ghibelline chief, who was the most important, in fact, he was the chief of the Florence Ghibellines for, for a period of time. And um, he was called Farinata probably because of the very um, bright or, or white color of his hair. Uh, it was a nickname, Farinata. From the year 1240, Farinata was the chief of the, the Ghibellines in Florence. Um, he was in the, the famous uh, Montaperti battle in uh, 1260 that was won by the Ghibellines as well. And Dante now, in, as in his usual extremely synthetic and extremely tight way, um, tight meaning effective, powerful way, he describes to us a lot of uh, important historical facts that precede preceded his time. As soon as Dante hears Farinata's voice, he is uh, intimidated, not only by this sudden voice from the tomb, but by the fact that he knows who he is, and uh, he knows how important Farinata was, what a powerful and uh, great, um, valuable man he had been in life. So he truly is intimidated. He says, the sound erupted from a coffer of stone, I drew back towards my guide in alarm. What are you doing? He said, Virgil. Go back again. The way he, this dialogue is rendered in, in Italian is Volgiti, che fai? Which is an extremely realistic, very realistic and uh, um, non, not particularly uh, high poetry style from, uh, from Dante's side. Go back again and see where Farinata has set up straight. From the waist up, you may behold the man. There's a lot to say about uh, Farinata's physical position how he emerges from the tomb and he is, uh, stand, is really standing with his chest up, almost puffed up, his chin up, and he's really projecting pride. He's the image of pride and self-discipline. This uh, will be important because it really contrasts with the other character that we'll see a little later on. Already my eyes were on his. He sat upright and seemed by how he wore his chest and brow to have great scorn for hell. He is defiant of hell. Farinata is in, in fire, in the fire, and Dante and Virgil have heard, actually heard already some la uh, lamentations and cries from this place, but Farinata pretends with his will strength to not feel even any pain. My leader set firm hands upon me at once. It's another moment here where Virgil actually touches Dante and pushes him forward to give him courage. Choose fitting words. Be careful what you say, Dante, to this guy, because this is not just anybody. And the question from Farinata is, who are your ancestors? Very blunt, very straight, uh, but also very realistic. Again, very realistic. And uh, what Dante would expect somebody like that to ask him. He has heard his Toscan accent. He knows that Dante is from Florence, but he doesn't know who he is. So he's asking, what kind of family are you, are you coming from? Dante has no problems uh, telling the truth to Farinata, and so he does. And uh, at that point, the dialogue takes, uh, uh, we could say, a wrong turn because it becomes really confrontational. And uh, as soon as Farinata hears from Dante um, who he is, the fact that his family was not uh, coming from Ghibelline lineage or 
they were not supporting his political faction. He said, these men were enemies to me. They fiercely opposed me and my forebears and my party. So twice I scattered them. He reminds rudely Dante that uh, he had kicked out his family twice from Florence uh, when the Ghibellines won. And uh, Dante, who is uh, full of pride himself, he um, answers, if ousted and abused, they return to claim their place from every quarter. Yours have not learned that art of return so well. Dante is really uh, quick, like almost like a silver tongue in uh, answering uh, Farinata. And, and, this, and now suddenly the second character comes up, which puts an emphasis of this uh, retort, almost like a winning retort of Dante against Farinata. Suddenly the face of a shade appeared beside him, showing the part from the chin up. A very comical image, if not if it wasn't as tragic and dramatic as it is, only the head of this uh, other person comes up from the tomb. And uh, his gaze began to dart anxiously around me, as though in expectation of someone with me. This Cavalcante di Cavalcanti, uh, father of Guido Cavalcanti, who was for a long time Dante's best friend in Florence. So his father, Guido's, Guido Cavalcanti's father, who is coming up from uh, this tomb, is assuming in seeing Dante that um, his son should be there as well, because he's almost assuming that uh, his son is a better or, or higher poet than Dante. They were the two best poets in, in Florence. Immediately, Dante uh, tries to explain himself. He says, my own strength has not brought me, but that of one who guides me through here, who is Virgil. This one guides me through here and is waiting yonder toward one your Guido perhaps has had scorned. A lot of controversy about this uh, word one, um, and uh, there is no real agreement. I noticed that many critics, um, maybe the majority, maybe, think this is uh, Virgil himself. So Guido, Dante's friend, was uh, uh, not particularly happy with Virgil, but mainly with what Virgil represented, which was love for empire and uh, a, a certain type of philosophy as well. Some people say that this one is actually Beatrice, and uh, the meaning would be kind of similar because uh, Dante and Guido had a lot of, um, after having a long friendship, but they started having a lot of dissimilar philosophical views, and these philosophical views were contrasting um, about the concept of love and about, the con and about politics as well. So this is what Guido's um, father and Dante are really referring to here. In fact, I've uh, looked a little bit into the relationship between the friendship between uh, Dante and Guido. And I've also had a chance to read um, another book by Marco Sant'Agata that's not been translated in English, unfortunately, which is a, a fictionalized uh, uh, biography of Dante, but only a portion of his life, where uh, there is a very fascinating scene where we see Dante going and introducing himself to Guido for the very first time. As a young kid, he was maybe 19 where when he first met uh, Guido Cavalcante. And um, that was as a consequence of Dante having published his first poems and uh, something of a chemistry, or something of a, a very strong bond started between Dante and Guido in those, in those days. However, the basic philosophy of the two men were, was different and um, Guido's family, including his father, this is why he's in this tomb, was informed by this Epicureanism. And um, on this uh, background of philosophy, the real breakdown of Guido and Dante's um, friendship happens. Dante wrote his first uh, long work called Vita Nova in 1294. And in this work, he actually explicitly explained that uh, they were not friends anymore with Guido, unfortunately. He 
they actually talk to each other uh, through their poems, through their publicly shared poems and works, which is a which was something that would happen, but uh, it's uh, a bitter end for such a friendship. It, it almost reminds me of this uh, of the not very good songs that uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon wrote against each other after the breakdown of the Beatles. Um, How do you sleep at night? It was just horrible. But uh, something similar happened between Dante and, uh, and Guido. From Guido's side, love um, was seen under a more pessimistic and irrational uh, type of view. From Dante's side, uh, as we know, love uh, becomes um, a, a way, a, a mean to elevate your spirit and your soul to God. So very, very different. And they could never agree on this point. So it's possible that uh, when Dante, in speaking to Guido's father, says, uh, uh, re refers to somebody who Guido doesn't particularly like, it's not Virgil, but it could be Beatrice, because not obviously in the sense of the person, but in the sense of what Beatrice represented. Dante has already um, made a certain mistake in a certain sense, because he already said uh, um, that Guido had scored. He referred to Guido in the past tense. Therefore, his father uh, immediately goes, what? Did I hear you say he had? Oh, tell. Is he not still alive? Does the sweet light not strike his eyes? At this point, Dante is confused. He doesn't, he's taken aback and therefore he doesn't reply immediately. And uh, there's no time. Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti collapses back and disappears. Um, it's funny how at this moment, without batting an eyelid and without uh, missing a bit, Farinata uh, reconnects with the uh, conversation that he was having with Dante just before being interrupted by Cavalcante de Cavalcanti. And he goes, the point you raised, my kin not good at learning that art. He's referring to the art of coming back. Um, I feel more agonized by that accursed fact than by this bad, very important qualification from Farinata. He is so strong. He's such a great and uh, uh, dominating figure, but he confesses to actually feel pain at the thought that uh, Florence is not in the hands of the Ghibellines anymore. This really pains him, not much being in a, a tomb full of lava and fire <laughs> around him. Uh, this is how important it is for him. So to rebut again against Dante, because at this point uh, uh, their back and forth have, have escalated and uh, become even more confrontational, in order to probably hit him, he gives him this prophecy. He says, when the lady, when the lady's face who rules this place, re referring here to Proserpina, uh, queen of the underworld, so um, she had been uh, married to um, Pluto uh, against her will, uh, but really she was a symbol for the moon, so he's referring to the moon, has kindled fewer than 50 times, there's been 50 months, uh, basically, um, then you will know how heavy that art, that art weighs. He's really um, going around in a circle around the, the fact that uh, Dante will be exiled and not be able to go back to Florence. Now tell me, why is that people so fierce in its decrees toward my kin. This is actually true. After the Guelphs uh, took over Florence again, they not only kicked out all the Ghibellines, uh, but uh, they were especially brutal in their decrees against uh, um, Farinata's family. Uh, his, uh, his own tomb was desecrated, his body taken out, and I believe two of his children or two of his sons were uh, decapitated in Florence. It was particularly harsh. Uh, this is uh, why Dante says, uh, uh, in, in answer, he says, it was the carnage and devastation that died the Arbia Red, referring to the Montaperti battle. The Arbia is the river next to Montaperti. 
it was red because of the blood of all the Guelphs that you, as a Ghibelline, uh, had slaughtered. So Dante is saying this is why they are so harsh. And they made the prayers in our temple savage. Temple referring to their political center in the ancient Roman way of Senate, sometimes called temple as well. His chicken, he said, it goes, I was not alone. Um, and surely I would not have chosen to join the others without some cause. But where all agreed to level Florence, there I was alone. One who defended her before them all. Very, very important historical fact. On one hand, he's saying I wasn't alone. When in, in uh, Montaperti, a lot of Ghibellines were there and uh, the number of deaths on both sides was, was very high. high. But where I was alone, and this is uh, factually true, is when uh, there was a decree from the king. I believe there was King Van Freddy who succeeded Frederick II. He decreed after the Ghibellines had won to completely um, destroy Florence to the ground and rebuild it. And uh, the only one who opposed this decree was Farinata. And being so strong and so powerful and so um, influential at his time, he was able to avoid this fate for, for Florence. So he reminds this as a, as a very important uh, fact. I pray you, so may your seed find peace again. Here we can hear that because of this and other reasons, but also because of this, Dante has a lot of respect for Farinata. If I hear rightly, you seem to foresee what time will bring. This is the conversation about uh, uh, the condemned souls, um, the condemned souls' superpowers, in a certain sense. Why, what can they, why can they see the future, but there's a, there seems to be a problem with the present? In this moment, can still see the future, um, uh, but obviously they will stop seeing the future in the moment when, uh, of Judgment Day, because there's not going to be any future after that. But as, of the, as for the present, they cannot uh, see it. Their uh, uh, sight, supernatural sight, is uh, uh, only able to see the past and, uh, and the future. And uh, there are some uh, theological reasons for this. One of the reasons why Dante mentions this right here in the 10th canto is that if we think about the concept of contrapasso, the flaming tombs are not really such a great contrapasso punishment for the heretics. Uh, yes, they remind, in a certain sense, the fires that heretics were burned on, but uh, this particular rule, the fact that they cannot see the present and the once uh, after Judgment Day they won't be able to see present and future, is almost the perfect contrapasso punishment for people who believe that the soul didn't exist after after death. So that's uh, um, why Dante chooses to mention this principle right here. And, and this is why immediately, very quickly, he says, um, move to compunction for my fault, I said, will you now tell the one who fell back to Cavalcante that his son is truly still among the living? Can you please reassure him? Um, it's true that uh, in the moment when these facts uh, are supposed to happen in the narration of the Divine Comedy, Guido Cavalcanti was still alive. However, he actually died only a few months later, in the summer of uh, 1300. At this point, uh, Virgil calls Dante. Uh, they, need to, they need to go, basically. And uh, really quickly, Dante is a little bit anxious because he still has questions for Farinata. He wants to talk more to him. And he says, um, as quickly as possible, please tell me uh, who is laying there with you? I want to know who is who's in this tomb. And I heard him answer, I lie with over a thousand of the dead. The second Frederick is among, is among the number, Frederick II, the second, who was uh, following the Epicurean philosophy. And uh, the cardinal, uh, meaning the Bishop of Bologna, Cardinal degli Ubaldini, who was um, very much uh, a political figure in those times who help the Ghibellines, and uh, I understand he was a little bit of a shady person. Dante goes back to Virgil, with my thoughts at work, mulling the words that bore such menace to me. My guide set out as we walked, he spoke, why is it you're disturbed? And I told him why. Uh, Preserve in memory what you have heard against yourself. 
Virgil is here trying to reassure Dante by evoking, by re reminding him that uh, in a certain moment in, in his journey, in this spiritual journey, he will uh, see Beatrice. And when you confront her radiance, Beatrice's radiance, whose eyes can see everything in their fair clarity, you shall learn what your life's journey will be. She will be able to tell you things that uh, have to do with your future, with your life, and so don't worry too much right now. The entire poem, The Divine Comedy, um, is very much about uh, um, the importance of patience and time when it comes to learning, when it comes to growing, uh, not only in spirit, in, in character. This is the second or third time, and we are only at the tenth canto, second or third time that the master Virgil tells Dante, be patient. Uh, this question that you have now is going to be answered later on. So there is a deeper meaning here as well. Um, here I would like to quote um, a couple of passages from um, Auerbach's book Mimesis and his uh, comments on, uh, on Canto X. Um, he talks about the astounding paradox of uh, what is called Dante's realism, the ability, Dante's ability to um, inject realism in uh, this uh, sublime, in this high poem. He says, um, imitation of reality is imitation of the sensory experience of life on earth. This about all art, in particular literature. Among the most essential characteristics of life on earth, uh, what seems to be is possessing a history and it's changing and developing. He's quoting Hegel here, the philosopher Hegel, who used the expression changeless existence when uh, commenting about Kante, Dante. Uh, he says, Dante's inhabitants of the three realms lead a changeless existence, which is true because they live an eternal existence with no changes. And uh, this would seem to conflict with the fact that if you want to be realistic, if you want to imitate reality, you need to infuse your creation with change. And so how do you do that? How do you create that? Um, in their phantom bodies, the souls of the damned in their eternal abodes have phenomenal appearance, freedom to speak and gesture and even to move about within limits, and thus within their changelessness, a limited freedom of change. I, I find this a really subtle point that uh, Auerbach is making. And um, we are basically in an eternal place, and yet we encounter concrete appearance and concrete occurrence there. And they talk about anything in a way that, as we've seen, uh, in with using dialogues that are extremely realistic. He is making the point that, uh, yes, there is this uh, um, incredibly complex uh, divine justice-driven structure, and we are seeing in this particular canto uh, two individuals suffering uh, uh, punishment in this uh, uh, fight But as a reader, what really moves you is not as much the fact that you see these souls punished in the tomb itself, but their real, uh, almost everyday, uh, little behaviors. The way they talk to Dante, the way they express themselves physically, uh, and this is, is what they refer to as Dante's realism, and this is what um, elevates this poem so much. Very often it's possible to demonstrate where he acquired this or that device of expression, but his sources are so numerous, his ear hears them, his intellect uses them so accurately, so simply, and yet so originally, that demonstrations and conjectures of this sort can only serve to increase our admiration for the power of his linguistic genius. So this is all for uh, this Sunday, and uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you, you're you still enjoying the Divine Comedy as much as I am, and uh, let's uh, discuss a little bit more. Thank you so much for the dialogue that is happening um, in the comments, in other, other videos. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, reconnect soon.